So quite some time ago now, way back in September, we began looking at this strand of beads, one like this, almost every Sunday, looking at each bead and what it might symbolize. If you have one of these with you, you might want to pull it out. If you don't, there are some cards that look like this on the welcome table by the door. As you go out, you might want to pick one up. It's got a picture of a bead strand on the back and then an explanation of each bead all the way down. So we've been working our way through our beads. The gold one representing God, always a good place to begin our prayers. Then a bumpy bead where we can bring all the bumps in the road that we experience in life before God. A bead with a hole in it, representing silence and the opportunity to sit quietly and listen for what God is saying to us. A stepping stone bead to pray to God to guide us on the next step in our journey of faith. A clear and black bead asking God to bring clarity into our times of darkness. The green bead about all that worries us. Everything we worry about we can bring to God. The red bead for those times when maybe we see red and find it really hard to pray for our enemies and yet we know God calls us to do that, to pray for our enemies and love them. This Sunday we come up to three beads in a row, which we're going to look at all together, three purple beads, because today we're talking about intercession. Intercessional prayer, intercessory prayer is when we pray for other people. A lot of this beforehand has been a lot about ourselves. But here we've got three beads representing other people and other places in our lives that need our prayers. And we hear those words from James saying, Are any among you sick? If so, they should call for the elders of the church. Elders in that case might mean church leaders, but it's actually more likely that that reference is to people who are further along in the faith than you, you are or I am. Sometimes you need someone who's just a little further along in this path to help guide you. So James says, are any of you sick? Then call for the elders of the church and have them pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Now that again may sound sort of strange to our modern ears, but in Bible times, oil was used for healing for all kinds of healing, not just physical healing, but for other kinds of healing, for spiritual healing, mental healing. The Good Samaritan used oil when he helped the man alongside the road who'd been beaten, and put the oil on the man's wounds. When Jesus sent out the 12 disciples, they went out and not only prayed for people, but anointed them with oil to bring them wholeness. So James says, if we are sick, call for the elders of the church and have them come pray over us and anoint us with oil. Then he goes on to say the prayer of faith will save the sick and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Does that sound strange to you? I mean, here we thought we were talking about people with sicknesses, illnesses, you know, reasons that you might call an MD. But here, James has lumped things together, sickness and sin, all in one fell swoop. It may seem strange to our modern ears, but when we stop and think about it, both those things, both physical illness and sin, separate us from God's beloved community and from God. Wrongdoing, if we end up in jail, certainly does separate us from other people, doesn't it? And then even when we get out of jail, it can be very hard to assimilate back into our communities and feel welcome again. So maybe that part's not so surprising that people feel separated then. But I think often when we are, have other kinds of illnesses, we also feel separated from others. Illness is not a sin, but sometimes we carry around a lot of guilt about our sicknesses. You know, if only I'd washed my hands more often. If only I'd gotten more exercise somehow. I know I ate too much. 
I know I drank too much. Maybe I smoked too much. Maybe I had things going on in my head that I shouldn't have had going on in my head. We can really beat ourselves up with a lot of guilt, when we, even when we're just sick. And that can separate us from God and God's children. And so I think it's helpful that James steps up and leaves us these words. He says, you know, when you're sick, no matter what kind of sickness, call for someone who's further along in the faith than you are and ask them to pray for you or perhaps even anoint you with oil. He says further down, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. That's tough too, I think, for us. The typical reaction for most of us when we see somebody who's struggling is to just look away and pretend we don't see it. So they can keep pretending that everything's fine and we can pretend that everything's fine. I call this, in my own mind, the Leave it to Beaver syndrome. Some of you may remember watching Leave it to Beaver and I think it's on rerun, so even if you're much younger than me, you might know what I'm talking about. But you know, Leave it to Beaver was a great TV show and, and I think we all wanted to be part of that family, those of us who watched it, you know? Really nothing horrible, horrible really happened. Young Beaver and Eddie Haskell used to get into a lot of mischief, remember? But somehow it all worked out. And then you had June Cleaver. She was always there, looking so pulled together. I mean, if only we could all vacuum in a beautiful dress and pearls and heels, just life would be good, right? <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm not close to June Cleaver at all. But then how about her husband, Mr. Cleaver? What's his first name? <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> when Ward comes home, he will know what to do. You know, everything will be fixed. And when we are dad, can't we be like Ward too and just know what to do when we walk in the door? Wouldn't that be great? And everybody would say, wow, that family, you know, that Cleaver family, they've got their act together. They don't have sickness. They don't have trouble. If only we were like that. Let's just pretend we're like that. But James says don't. James isn't into the Leave it to Beaver syndrome. In our reading this morning, we're told to do exactly the opposite. Let go of those illusions of leave it to beaver. Don't avert our eyes and pretend that everything is okay in my life, in your life. Instead, and this is radical, but the Christians are radical, reach out. Dare to reach out to someone who's struggling. Reach out. Dare to pray for them. Hang on to those purple beads. You know, if you watch the news, it's pretty easy to find other people to pray for. It's almost overwhelming. I, I, sometimes I think I need a whole lot more purple beads than I have on this string. You know, Puerto Rico, Nevada, Manhattan. Every time I turn on the news, there's somebody else to add. But you know, if I don't know what's going on in someone's life, it's harder to pray for them. And if we keep up appearances and pretend that we're living in the Cleaver household and nobody knows what's going on with us, it's going to be awfully hard for them to know how to pray for us. And so we try to do that here at church, sometimes right here in the front, like Eric did. Other times in our small groups, it's a wonderful place to lift up the things that we're struggling with and trying to do better at the ways that God calls us to be, that we're trying to follow. Sometimes, you know, you've got a pastor, you can talk to me. We have safe, trustworthy places where we can practice confessing our struggles and admitting to our struggles to others who then will hear them and will be able to pray for us. And I think here at St. John's, we really shine in this area. We have our prayers and concerns every Sunday when we have a chance to lift up 
prayers for other people and for ourselves and to hear how God is working in our lives. Every so often we do prayer shawls and we'll be doing prayer shawls in a little bit. When we hear of people who are going through tough times and need our prayers, we can dedicate and pray over these prayer shawls and send them to them so they can be wrapped in our prayers and not be separated from us. This Sunday, we also will have pictures of our saints who died in the last year overhead on the screen. A visual reminder that the saints also pray for us even from afar. We have a healing team here at St. John's. Every Communion Sunday, they'll be standing right here today at the end of the rail, ready to lay a, a gentle touch on our shoulder or our head, to say a prayer if we like, to show us the oil they bring, and if we want it, to place a little dab on our foreheads. And not only on Sunday mornings here at St. John's, this congregation is so good at reaching out to people who would otherwise be separated and isolated from God's love and God's people. I know we have people involved in the needle exchange program. We have people involved with people who are struggling to get their act together, coming together to join them for a Thanksgiving dinner. People who go to meetings trying to find a way to provide affordable housing to people who so desperately need it people who are willing to travel far away, as far away as Louisiana, to help people recover from natural disasters. We don't fall too often, I hope, into the leave it to beaver syndrome. We don't simply avert our eyes. We try so hard to reach out to others in times of need, to offer our prayers and our physical presence and support. For we know that prayer is powerful and changes lives and relationships. Some time ago, I read a study, a scientific study, that showed that people who felt they had a lot of support handled stress much better than people who thought they had no support. So if we know people are praying for us, that lowers our stress and helps us to cope with what we must deal with. Few things are as powerful as when we're feeling vulnerable or in a time of need and know that through it all, someone is praying for us. And that is what intercessory prayer is. It's praying for other people, other places, reaching out to people who feel broken or separated. It restores the weary and shapes us into a community of faith where we are committed to each other and to others that all might feel together in communion with each other and with God, for that is what God wants for us. Praise God for the guidance of Holy Scripture. Praise God for this church, full of so many people willing to reach out, as James calls us to. Amen.